it's not as though Xinjiang is a black hole for news. If it was, it would be a big one, since the region is twice the size of Germany. What Xinjiang is, is a black hole for a certain kind of news. The official narrative in, in Xinjiang has always been it was a backward, feudal region. And the Communist Party went in the 1950s and restructured both the social and economic hierarchies there. That has been a pretty ironclad narrative. In 2009, that changed a little bit. There were these deadly ethnic riots between Han Chinese, the majority ethnic population in China, and the Muslim Uyghurs. And several hundred people at least died, according to state media. That served as a psychological and legal justification for many of the security measures and surveillance measures that we see today. Satellite images prove Chinese government has built uh, hundreds, if not more, of detention camps, and all they are also expanding. And hundreds of thousands of people are there just uh, for being Uyghur, being Turkic, and being Muslim, not because they have committed any acts of violence or terrorism. The government has been very clear, uh, the Chinese government, and the way they see this. They perceive they have a problem that could also be a security threat. They believe that there are radical elements who have infiltrated the population and convinced people that they should uh, have an independent homeland. And this is this kind of separatism and also uh, <clears throat> uh, extremism. China's government has reason to be cautious over Xinjiang. Since the ethnically driven unrest that flared up in 2009, there has been periodic violence and bloodshed attributed to Uyghur movements, including one attack at the heart of the capital, Tiananmen Square. Beijing's response, however, putting a community of 11 million people under surveillance, incarcerating so many in the name of indoctrination, has been wildly disproportionate. China's government argues it's out to stop what it calls the three forces, separatism, extremism, and terrorism. And China's media apparatus has adopted that term, parroting it in the same unquestioning way much of the U.S. media did with the so-called war on terror. Beijing's man in Xinjiang, Chen Chuanguo, was made party boss there after having cut his teeth in another ethnic trouble spot, Tibet. He has adapted some of the security measures used in Tibet to Xinjiang, including a clear focus on surveillance and technology. Things like police checkpoints every few hundred meters, forcible checking of people's mobile phone devices, um, of their laptops, um, as well as surveillance by things like iris scans, facial recognition cameras, um, and DNA checks. You have many Uyghurs who are saying that they're simply being called in because they exchanged text messages or shared an email several years ago that contained religious, uh, religious content and now they're being called into a re-education camp or being questioned at a detention camp for that it's very small action. You can wander around some of the residential neighborhoods where Uyghur communities were once concentrated and find them to be completely deserted. There's no charges, no trial. Um, people just sort of disappear into these places for many months at a time and, and even longer. Mega Rajagopalan has her own story to tell. She is one of the very few foreign reporters who managed to get into Xinjiang to report on the situation there. Just weeks after her piece was published by BuzzFeed, she was expelled from the country. Chinese officials want to limit information and imagery coming out of the region. Controlling access is central to their strategy. But there are some cameras they cannot control, the ones in space. The satellite photos of the detention centers featured in the international media will not be seen on Chinese television. Domestic reporters there are tightly controlled. As a Uyghur journalist, Alim Setoff reports on the story from Washington. He is the director of the U.S.-funded Radio Free Asia's Uyghur service. It is uh, obviously impossible for Uyghur reporters on the ground there to do any kind of uh, reporting on these issues because we have already reported ourselves that you know, Uyghur writers and uh, Uyghur scholars who in any way spoken out against China's repressive policies have been detaining these camps. But for Chinese journalists, uh, this is an extremely sensitive subject. They are required to follow the Chinese government's line. 
they have to repeat the same thing. So they cannot independently report on what is happening to the Uyghur people. So in the West, we expect the uh, press to be investigative, to, to show us all the holes in what is generally a democracy. But in China, it's very different. There's this close association between the press and the government, as seen through the eyes, I think, of the Chinese government. I mean, you can look at Chinese history over many, many centuries. Any time the, the center is not strong, you basically make fiefdoms out of you know, different parts of China. So they're determined that their press will not become something that divides the country. It needs to be something that unites it. Officially, it's the People's Republic of China. But the voice that matters more than any other belongs to President Xi Jinping. President Xi has had no qualms in telling Chinese journalists and the news outlets they work for that the media's ultimate loyalty must be to the state, not the story. And Beijing's interest in what happens in Xinjiang isn't just political, it's economic. The state lies in the pathway of the Belt and Road Initiative, a mammoth infrastructure and development project championed by President Xi to create a vast international trade network centered around China. Its location is very strategic because it sits between much of eastern China and the countries of Central Asia. And Xinjiang is home to about a fifth of China's total oil reserves. It's also the biggest producer of coal as a region. It's vitally, vitally important from an energy security perspective to China. And this explains this kind of obsessive desire for stability in that region, at the cost of things like basic individual rights, so as not to upset its economic development plans, both at home and abroad. Xi Jinping has been president for six years now. His burgeoning power and influence have been compared to Mao Zedong's, who once said, the role and power of newspapers consist in their ability to present the party's line, its specific policies, goals and work methods to the masses. Half a century later, in Xinjiang, for the media outlets that spread the word, those same rules still apply.